Good morning. I'm Matt Schaefer. Welcome to the Boston Sunday Review. Dr. Wendy Trubo is co-founder and quality director of Visions Healthcare, a functional healthcare center in Wellesley, and she's an expert on childhood ADD, ADHD, and Dr. Trubo joins us this morning on the Boston Sunday Review. Wendy, good morning. Good morning. What is functional medicine? <laughs> functional medicine is an approach to your care that looks at your body and your complaints as an interconnected whole. For example, many individuals will complain of fatigue and a functional medicine approach will look for what the root cause of that issue is. So we're not content simply to look for, do you have hypertension that's causing your fatigue? We wanna look for what's causing the hypertension that's causing the fatigue. Are you a fancy new expression or word for what used to be called holistic medicine? Probably, although in functional medicine, they, we do use a broad array of scientific and evidence-based testing that looks for the root cause of the disease. For example, in any evaluation, a functional medicine physician could look at your saliva testing, stool testing, blood testing, or urine, in addition to the typical range of blood tests you would ob obtain in your doctor's office. At Visions Healthcare, you not only offer a full complement of so-called traditional medicine, Correct. but you also offer body work, acupuncture, and energy healing <clears throat> techniques. Correct. We have actually a wide array of integrative services, and all of our providers function as part of our team. We share a computer system as needed. We communicate between each other to discuss a patient. And really, we view all of these components as adjuncts to the whole. So a person coming in to visit you may be seeing four or five different experts Possibly. at the same time. And all of those experts would be discussing his or her care? If needed, absolutely. Um, it's interesting to me how you guys actually have sort of divided the work uh, um, load over at, uh, at Visions Healthcare. <laughs> medical practice is divided into uh, medical specialties, functional medicine, nutrition, and physical medicine. So what falls under medical specialties the medical specialties we have at visions healthcare include family practice internal medicine gynecology psychiatry behavioral health we have a palliative care specialist and we also have uh, osteopathy uh, so with the exception of osteopathy those would be your sort of typical doctors that Correct. you they're would... all board certified physicians under functional medicine who would one be able to visit at uh, visions healthcare same docs same docs <laughs> it's simply the different approach okay uh, nutrition yes so you have an uh, on on staff nutritionist or nutritionists correct and you are very uh, you're more concerned with than probably your most typical doctors are with what goes into your mouth. We are. Our nutritionists who work in both the Denham and the Wellesley location look at do individuals have particular food sensitivities that would make their weight loss or health program more difficult to achieve or easier to achieve depending on what they're eating. Then you have a whole division that you call <laughs> physical medicine. Correct. And what does that entail? That entails a board certified sports medicine doc. It includes a physical therapist, it includes a chiropractor, and as needed it can include the body worker massage therapists. <laughs> And then there's the whole wellness division, which yes. the body therapist and, and the massage therapist would fall under <clears throat> as well. So what's under in wellness is acupuncture, body work, energy, and spirituality. That's usually not something that your doc talks to you about when you go in for your annual physical. You're right, and shame on us. Uh, we really look at healthcare from five critical areas. Your physical body, your biochemical makeup, that's where the doctors typically look, your vitamin D, your minerals, your 
emotional, spiritual, and energetic makeup. And an imbalance in any of those areas can throw off the rest of your health. You also have a specialty in stress reduction? We do. We have a person who runs the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. That's a program that was designed by John Kabat-Zinn out at UMass, and she is certified in leading that program. It's an eight-week stress reduction program that people learn specific techniques in order to be able to manage their stress. So you are concerned with not just the body, but mind and awareness as well. You can't separate them. They are absolutely linked. So, for example, the minute before you get into a car accident, you have a thought, oh, no, I'm going to get in a car accident, and your heart starts to race. And your responses are different. Your thoughts matter in the, in the way your body responds. So managing your thoughts and managing the way your body responds is critical. So once upon a time, as far as the American medical establishment is concerned, or was concerned, the body-mind <clears throat> connection was something that was extremely radical. Uh, why and how have things changed? That's a huge question, Matt. I think that as a culture, we've evolved to the point where it's important to be well cared for in many different ways. And certainly what we hear from our patients is they are a demand to be interacted with as an entire human being not just as a collection of complaints, but really a human being whose life impacts their health. And really we've seen it as a groundswell and a, a de, a, these, these are the demands our patients are making. One of your goals, however, <clears throat> is to create cohesion in the clinical community between yes. all healing modalities. Yes. So the obvious question is, is American medicine today more open to, and I don't want to be pejorative in this, but more open to quote unquote alternative healing modalities. Sometimes those so-called alternatives are now mainstream. Yes, I, I think it's a matter of recognizing where the traditional medical association is strong. We're experts in emergency care. We're experts in obstetrical care. We're experts when you have an acute surgical need. However, I think that we haven't done as good of a job as at keeping people healthy. It hasn't been a priority at, to date. The other modalities that you just referred to really do focus on keeping people well. And so it seems a natural marriage to combine things that we're really good at with people who are really good in areas we're weak. Were there courses <clears throat> in functional medicine at med school? No. <laughs> No. Uh, in some ideal world, yes, that will occur at some point in the future. So have you, as being co-founder of Visions Healthcare, <laughs> did you go out and, and seek out like-minded people, or did the universe bring you like-minded people, and that was the germination of this idea? Uh, this idea started with my husband, whose lifelong dream was to own a medical center that provided a full range of care. And is he a doctor as well? He is. He's the co-founder with me. He's actually the, the, this was his lifelong dream. And so when we opened in 2008, this was the culmination or the beginning for him of his lifelong dream in reality. But when you deal with other doctors outside of your practice, do you find more of an openness to this or does it depend? It depends. I think it's difficult to blanket statement an entire group of physicians and say everybody's open or everybody is not open. Uh, we do use evidence-based testing and evidence-based treatment. So typically what we can provide individuals is the data behind what we're doing, and that helps a lot of physicians because physicians like data. Is this a generational change? Are younger physicians more open to this? 
You know, it's very interesting you ask that, Matt, because the majority of our physicians are not straight out of residency. The majority of our physicians have been in practice for a while and really wanted to provide a type of care to their patient that as of yet is not available in the typical model of healthcare in which a patient is seen every 10 to 15 minutes. There's just no way that we can approach you and evaluate you head to toe in 10 minutes. It's not fair to you. So what happens when one comes for one's first appointment at Visions Healthcare? Can, can, can I come to you as, as, as my primary care physician? Uh, we have a number of primary care physicians at Visions Healthcare. I'm a gynecologist. So, so I would have a difficult time. You should not come see me for your <laughs> primary care, but the women but, certainly but, can. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the, I was the royal you. Yes, the royal we. That being said, yes, we do have a, a primary care physicians who accept new patients. And a new patient visit and an annual visit are typically an hour. And in that hour, we look at everything, your story, your complaints, where you'd like to be, what your health goals are. How do you get there? What are the roadblocks? That's a typical visit. Most patients who come for initial consult will come for a follow-up visit at least once to discuss their progress, to discuss their results, and then typically there's one more follow-up to check in. <clears throat> in an increasingly expensive medical environment, many of these so-called alternative health modalities are less expensive. Also less invasive yes and oftentimes equally if not more effective how has the health insurance industry uh, embraced a center like yours um, you know our goal is really that this model works for the patient the provider and the health insurance people I'm not clear that they've necessarily embraced us the services that are typically covered by insurance at any doctor's office would be covered in our office. And then the quote unquote alternative or integrative services or wellness services are typically paid for, unfortunately, out of pocket by patients. But interestingly enough, more and more insurance co companies have been covering things like chiropractic <clears throat> and acupuncture, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, treatments that 10 years ago they would not have. Yes. So that we've seen an expansion in the possibility of coverage. And more and more so-called mainstream doctors are recommending yes. acupuncture and chiropractic and massage yes. and, and those things that fall outside the typical uh, menu of what the traditional doctor offers. I think we've really recognized that while we're experts in certain areas, we aren't experts in others, and it really does behoove us to do this for patients and send them to places where they can get their needs cared for. Is there a natural sense of wellness to the body? Certainly is, that's the approach that all osteopaths take, is that I mean, the body is... Is there like a stasis or balance? <clears throat> uh, are most, uh, is, is, is there... A, a sense of wellness that either is there or falls in, into imbalance? Great question, Matt. So look at children. The vast majority of children are not only well, but they're vital and they have tons of energy. And things then happen over the course of a lifetime to decrease that. Those things that happen and the ways we respond are the things that take us out of balance. But innately, intrinsically, we start out in balance and then the ways we eat, the ways we sleep, the way we live, all throw us off. Is falling out of balance always immediately recognizable? No. No, most of the time, actually, that's what's so terrible and difficult to manage is that most of our patients and most individuals don't wake up on some day and say, I felt amazing yesterday and I feel terrible today. What happens is there's a slow progression of decline and one day it becomes what I'll say is bad enough. 
So it wasn't bad enough simply to be a little fatigued. It wasn't bad enough to have a little bit of irritable bowel, but at some point for every person it gets bad enough and that has them visit the physician. So typically in our society, we visit the physician to deal with symptoms. Correct. In the dominant healthcare model today, medication is most commonly used to treat those symptoms. Yes. And that's been true of, of American medicine for the last century or so? Yeah, certainly since like the 1940s when I think penicillin was invented, we really became the medication nation. But you guys believe that it's actually more important to treat not only the symptoms, but the underlying causes. Correct. I, I referred to hypertension earlier. Many causes of hypertension can be traced to a lifestyle chain, a lifestyle underlying cause. So for example, the foods we eat can increase our blood pressure, our weight, our cholesterol. If we can in, impact the root cause, the hypertension can go away. So is it something of like a, <clears throat> a, a, is it something like of a uh, the approach of a detective when you are dealing with your patients? Absolutely, it's a lot of fun. Uh, typically, how we look at health is what is that underlying imbalance? Is it in the gut associated lymphoid tissue, the gut, or is it in the adrenal glands, or is it the lifestyle someone's leading? Certainly, if someone goes for six weeks and only sleeps three hours a night, they're going to have a problem. So we're looking for detecting what is that? What What is it? And that's really why it takes an hour, because a lot of people aren't going to come in the room and lay it on the table of, well, here are all my bad habits. We really sometimes do have to tease them out. How much of that first visit is conversational and how much of it is observational? Oh, you know, I think it's, I don't think you can tease those out. Those, those, every time I'm talking with a patient, what I'm looking at, and all of us really, do they, are they having any respiratory issues? Are they having trouble breathing? How does their skin look? A lot of women who come into my office have thinning hair. How does their hair look? Is it thin? Is it normal? Are their hands shaking when they go to reach for their water bottle? How are they in their body? Are they comfortable? Are they uncomfortable? How's their emotional state? Do they feel nervous? All of those things occur within the conversation. When you ask people how they feel, do they know how to tell you? Mm -hmm. And do they, and are they able to um, recognize if they're not feeling the way they should be feeling? No, most people, when it's hello, how are you? Most people respond, I'm fine. We're so conditioned to be fine. But really, when we get into a conversation and I say, well, how is your sleep? Is the sleep quality good? Do you sleep through the night or do you get up? And if you get up, do you go back to sleep? We can tease out that actually their sleep's not so good. And do you have any anxiety? Do you worry about things? Well, that's not being fine. That's actually being out of balance. How's your energy? Do you wake up in the morning full of energy? Most people will say no. So they are fatigued. Do you ever get headaches? Oh, yeah. People forget because unless it's occurring the moment they're sitting with you, they're not thinking about it. But in the course, that's really why it takes an hour to pull it all out. How important is proactivity <laughs> in terms of the practice of functional medicine? Getting people to, to go in and be taking care of themselves and be doing the right things to be healthy as opposed to coming in to see you when they're out of stasis, out of, out of balance. I think every human being approaches imbalance differently. So there, I, I say that when people are making lifestyle change, there are two wagons they could get onto. One lifestyle change wagon is they make a change, they feel amazing, they never look back, and avoidance of pain is very powerful. They never want to go back. So the, that's one group who stays what I'll call on the wagon. There's another group that will make a change and feel better and then forget the value 
and go off the wagon. And when they start to feel poorly again, we'll then make the change again. And I think it depends where people are in their process and how they approach it. And unlike most traditional docs, when you say uh, avoidance of pain is is very powerful, emotional pain can impact your physical health. Yes, absolutely. So we're really looking for what is that source of pain? Let's take it away. When we come back, we're going to take a little bit of a, a deeper look into functional medicine and also talk with uh, Dr. Trubo about her specialty in childhood ADD, ADHD. First, though, we're going to pause uh, for these words. You are listening to the Boston Sunday Review. Good morning. I'm Matt Schaefer. Welcome back to the Boston Sunday Review. If you're just tuning in, our guest is Dr. Wendy Trubo. She's co-founder and quality director of Visions Healthcare, a functional healthcare center in Wellesley. And we've been talking about functional medicine. What is it again, Wendy? Functional medicine is a comprehensive look at the entire body. And from our approach, what is going on physically, biochemically, emotionally, spiritually, and energetically, and their interplay of all of those areas of health. What part do pharmaceuticals play in functional medicine? All of our physicians are board certified in their respective specialties, and if somebody needs medicine, they're gonna get it. So if you walked into my office and your blood pressure was through the roof, certainly I'm gonna tell you you need to relax, but you're gonna, get, you're gonna walk out with a medicine to control you so that you're safe while we're getting you taken care of. What about so-called natural agents? Uh, somebody very wise said it best that food is medicine and you are what you eat. So I would say that's probably the most natural of all of our agents, but certainly supplements and other uh, natural agents play a role. So supplements have a wide range of options. So you kind of took the wind out of my sails for my next <laughs> question, which was, what role does nutrition play in overall wellness? Sorry about that. Nutrition is critical in overall wellness because you are what you eat. And if, and I can't say that enough, and perhaps half of every session with our patients is spent on what are they eating and what's the quality of the food? Which is probably not <clears throat> typical at the average doctor's office. It's probably not, no. Well, I mean, in my other job, I had 15 to 20 minutes with a patient, so I really didn't evaluate what you ate as long as you weren't gonna pass out in my office. I didn't talk about your food. Most mainstream docs aren't interested in <laughs> patients' spiritual beliefs. That's true. I don't tend to dictate or get into what your spiritual beliefs are, but I want to know that you have something that gives you sustenance and brings you peace and gives you support. Because a positive attitude can be more powerful than a pill. Yeah, interesting. It's been shown that individuals who have a strong community support live longer and live healthier. So your spiritual community absolutely plays a role in your health. Is it important for patients <clears throat> to own his or her condition? Yeah. Uh, Ed Levitan, the co-founder of Visions Healthcare, says this is a team. You're going to do 99% of the work, and we're going to do 1% of the work. So certainly when we have a patient and they go home, we're not with them in their house helping them cook. It would be great. We just don't have that leisure. So it's the onus really is on the patient to That's do their own health. That's a big health. difference between the mainstream medicine in America and you guys. I mean, most people go to their doctor to be taken care of, not to be told that you need to take care of yourself. Shame on us. I mean, really, we need to bring forward that individuals do have the ability to make themselves healthy. Perhaps what they're missing are the, is the knowledge or the tools. And that's where we play the role, is to give them the array of knowledge. And they it's like a pick list. They can pick what they like. At uh, Visions Healthcare, how many patients <clears throat> visit both medical and wellness Ooh. practitioners? Uh, it's probably in the range of about 60%. The majority of patients do come through the door because their friend said to them, you got to go see this doctor. They spent an hour with me. 
but then which they is go, just such a change. Yeah, it's 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 hugely different. But then they also need to have their back adjusted, or they need a massage, or they want to discuss uh, how to better manage their stress. When does lab work <clears throat> come in? Lab work comes in often at the very first visit because what we want to know is what is your vitamin and nutrient status? Are you, even with the best of intentions, eating foods that are making you sick? How is that occurring in your body? Some people have a genetic predisposition to illness, and we want to know those individuals so that we can manage their care differently. How about x-rays <laughs> and other non-invasive high-tech tests? Uh, so as a gynecologist, if someone presents to me and says they're having pain in their pelvis, they probably will end up with an ultrasound. But we do invasive diagnostic testing only when it when it's really justified or needed. So surgery is always a last option? Uh, I would say for anybody, surgery is a last option. Uh, some people really like to go to surgery, but most people don't want surgery. Does the Visions approach work for patients of any age? Yes, absolutely. So you work with a lot of children, I understand, who fall under the umbrella of ADD, ADHD. Is that, am I saying it correctly or is it one or, one or the other? It's actually, you're saying it correctly because there is one, uh, ADD is Attention Deficit Disorder, and ADHD is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Some children have one component without the other. So you can have one without the other. Correct. Some children just have difficulty concentrating but aren't necessarily hyperactive. What are the <coughs> symptoms? How would one suspect that one's kid uh, had an attention uh, or hyperactivity problem? There, there's a lot of different ways. Um, as a parent, watching your child and are they able to focus on a task are they able to typically this won't manifest all that easily until children enter kindergarten or first grade where children are required to sit still for longer periods of time in preschool they're running around there is no formal learning process necessarily so around grade school is when parents will typically say or teachers will say to the parent you know, your child's not able to concentrate on a task. Your child's not able to sit still for a task. Sometimes these children will feel frustrated. They can't master something. It could be noticed in children who are delayed compared to their peers around mastering learning issues such as math recognition of numbers, recognition of letters, reading. Some children aren't able to concentrate. So they're going to show up because they're failing to progress. So it's not something that a parent would <laughs> notice with their two or three or four-year-old necessarily? I think it's a little more difficult to label a two-year-old as hyperactive because every two-year-old I've ever met is pretty active. Is there some sort of, uh, of, of bellwether <clears throat> test uh, that these kids have or that you apply in your head when you're examining these kids? Uh, really what we're going by is the parents' stories. Are these children tough? Do Some of these children have an underlying anxiety disorder, so it's less so that they have an attention issue, they have an anxiety issue, they can't concentrate because they're nervous, they're worried. Really what this is about is taking a functional medicine approach towards that child and what it is that's throwing that child out of balance. How common is <clears throat> Uh, ADD or ADHD? A lot of kid are, kids are med medicated, so I think it's pretty common. So it's common. And it are is. the numbers rising yes. or they are rising? Are the they numbers. rising because there are more people being diagnosed? Yes, but why is that? I, I think really more children are medicated today than 40 years ago. And this is an illness that can have negative effects both in the classroom and on the playground Absolutely. so it's not just it's not just in a learning environment but it's also in in your socialization with other kids kids are kids are tough on other kids and so any anything that's perceived as different can be a source of teasing and it's usually treated with stimulant yes. pharmaceuticals 
Yes. Ironically, right? Yes. Don't whisper because it's the, on the microphone. I'm not going to ask you how it's it gone. works. But but that's how it's usually treated, correct? correct? And these can have side effects. Correct. Is there any connection with uh, autism spectrum? I'm not actually sure about the answer to that. that that's a good question. I think that what is on the autism spectrum, certainly Asperger's syndrome, ADHD, ADD, are indications that something in this child is out of balance. Any genetic link, <clears throat> is there a, is there a gen, can there be a genetic component? So that's a great question. So for children who have food sensitivities, I'm gonna use the term food sensitivities and food allergies interchangeably. I don't mean that they stop breathing, but I mean that they react in some way. So for children who have food allergies or sensitivities, a lot of these children, if the sensitivity is to gluten, that can be a genetic predisposition. If you are an adult with ADD or ADHD, are you prone to having kids who may have it as well? Uh, if your ADD is due to an imbalance in your neurotransmitters, which is due to a food you're eating that is throwing off the gut or your intestinal balance, your chance of passing that genetic predisposition onto your child is 50-50 because it's, it's um, autosomal. It's not linked to your gender. So the chance of sending that to your child is 50%. Assuming your spouse has not doesn't have that, your kid has a 50% chance of getting that gene to food sensitivity. So you are especially interested in the connection uh, to of, of kids with ADD and ADHD to the environment and what people eat. And you're especially interested in the enteric nervous system in our bellies, a.k.a. <laughs> your gut, yes. what some scientists are calling, and this was really uh, revelatory for me when I, I mean, this, this was the headline from the interview when I was preparing for it. S scientists are calling this the second brain. So first of all, when we say the gut, what are we talking about? We're talking about essentially your your intestinal tract, your GI tract, starts at your mouth and ends at your anus. So it's your from your from your stomach, from your from mouth, your mouth all through the way your out. stomach all the way out. That's <clears throat> and and it's called the enteric nervous system. The, I'm sorry. the The GI tract starts at your mouth and ends at your anus in your intestines, which start from the minute food leaves your stomach, okay. and then ends at your anus. That is where your "quote unquote" second brain occurs. What are we talking about here? It's it's really crazy and it's really cool. So, 80 percent of the body's neurotransmitters are contained in your intestines. Now, most people look at me like I've grown a second head when I say that to them, because when someone presents with anxiety, depression, attention deficit, memory issues, we're gonna actually evaluate what is their intestinal tract doing. So people who are depressed take a drug that raises serotonin levels, Prozac, Zoloft, raises serotonin levels and 80%, 70% of the serotonin in your body is produced in your gut-associated lymphoid tissue. How crazy is that? Your gut runs your brain. So the goal for a lot of patients who are depressed or who have attention issues is to look at what is throwing that gut out of balance, what's irritating the gut so it can't do its job. So butterflies in the <laughs> stomach may be more than a metaphor. Oh, it's real. It really is, it really does occur. It's amazing. So when you start with a possible ADD, ADHD diagnosis, you evaluate intens intestinal function. I'm just curious, as a functional physician, knowing this information, do you uh, look into intestinal function with all of your patients? Pretty much, yeah. It's pretty rare for a patient to well, wait three months for a consult and not have any complaints that I could link back to their intestinal function. Is there a possible link between gluten and 
ADD, ADHD. This is one of my favorite conversations. Uh, the top three allergens are gluten, dairy, and soy. And particularly gluten and dairy, the, th the way that gluten has been genetically modified raises the chance that it will be allergenic or cause issues. So absolutely, yes. Why is it that so many people um, have been developing celiac disease <laughs> or, or some sort of symptoms of irritable bowel sy syndrome? Well, let's back up to the 1950s where the, the 85 to 90 percent of households, there was someone at home who cooked a meal. And when you got home, you ate a meal. Now we fast forward to 2013, and if you look at what's called the standard American diet, otherwise known, I'm sorry, as SAD, the SAD diet, it contains a gluten-containing carbohydrate at every meal. That's one issue. We're eating far too many gluten grains in far too much quantity, and the gluten we're eating is genetically modified to be more allergenic. So even eating less of it it's more allergenic or would, more. <laughs> would all of us benefit, whether you have celiac disease or not, but would all of us benefit from a gluten-free or at least a reduced gluten diet? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so I think every American would benefit from looking at their plate and making sure that 80% of it is covered with vegetables. I think every American would benefit from utilizing processed carbohydrates as a side dish or treat as opposed to the main main portion of a meal. And then there is a subset of individuals, well, it's a pretty large subset, but a group of individuals who would absolutely benefit from either reducing or eliminating gluten entirely from their diet. So when you're working with kids with <laughs> this, is is gluten a big issue? What they yes. eat a big issue? Yeah, the the family dynamic and the family food intake is a hot topic. Absolutely. What about dairy? Dairy is second on the list too. Da gluten and dairy are both foods groups. I guess that's sort of loose to call them a food group, but food groups that cause inflammation. And the first line of defense in the body is the gut. So in an individual who is sensitive to one of these foods and and now let's go to dairy. Most kids eat, drink a glass of milk at lunch, eat it in their cereal for breakfast, and have a glass of milk at dinner. So three times a day we're getting a food, and perhaps they have yogurt or cheese. So these foods irritate the lining of the gut. What about omega-3 fatty acids? Omega-3 fatty acids are critical for brain function. So any child with ADD or ADHD definitely deserves a high-quality uh, omega fatty acid. Absolutely. And vitamin Vitamins versus we, vitamin deficiencies? Yeah, we, we, that's part of the functional medicine approach is to look at the vitamin and mineral deficiencies and anything that's out of balance to replete. So do most kids who come to you, uh, are they currently taking medications? And is it, your, is it your goal, if possible, to get them off the meds by moderating uh, what they put in their mouths? Most parents who come to us w do want their children off medications. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's my goal, although if, if it were my kid, that would be my goal. Our goal is really to support the parents and having the child's life work and their family life work. And if that means getting that child in balance to get them off meds, absolutely. And is the kind of really detailed attention that you pay to the nutrition of kids who are diagnosed with attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, is that kind of, uh, of detailed interest in nutrition and, and um, um, lifestyle, is that played out with other p patients coming in, adults who are seeing you as a functional physician? Yes. I would say that our approach lies in the basis of that what goes into your body and the effect it has plays a critical role in your experience of health. So your food cannot be separated from your health and you, you are what you eat. I'm just curious. I mean, you're obviously not the person to ask 
ask this because you're the <laughs> you're the co-founder of the place. But um, what's been the reaction of people who come to see you? I mean, is this really different for most people? And and do they see results? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, we started with three employees on in July of 2008, and we are opening our second location this month in a week and a half. And we've grown to approximately 60 employees with uh, 12 doctors and another one joining us very soon. And do you think this is the future of American medicine? I certainly hope that it is. I think that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we do need to look at people's function and food intake and lifestyle in order to have them be truly healthy. I think that every physician went into medicine to heal. And unfortunately, the tools in our toolbox don't allow us to do that. And there are other tools out there, so why not take advantage of them? There's tons of tools. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation. It's the, 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 the second the brain, <laughs> the second brain. Uh, it's, it's, worth, it's worth looking into and another conversation on it sometime in the future. Dr. Wendy Trubo is co-founder of Visions Healthcare. And for more information, you can visit Visions Healthcare.